Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, and, and welcome, welcome uh, all, all of you to this session. We've, we've had, had some very, very powerful and thought-provoking sentiments and views expressed in the course of the morning on the Engaged University, and, and during the session we aim to take it forward, and uh, the, the focus, focus of this session is the and engaged university and, and transformation. In the, in the higher education, education, we've been grappling with the with, with this subject of uh, engagement and transformation for many years, because we know and we can feel that the, the notion of a university, solely as a citadel, citadel of academic endeavor, was, was becoming impossible to maintain as, as hard questions, questions were being asked about our role within the society that we were located. The chair of Yusuf this morning and also in the previous session mentioned the words of Chris Brunk, a former vice chancellor of Stellenbosch University and currently the emeritus vice chancellor of Newcastle University. And, and he talks, talks about, about the two fundamental, fundamental questions that, that must be answered by, by universities, but also by society. He talks, talks about, firstly, what are we good at? And, and secondly, what are we good for? As, As institutions, we spend much time in, in reflecting and celebrating what, what we are good at. at in, in terms, terms of research, research in, in terms, terms of education, and, and very little time reflecting deeply on what, what we are good for. It, it is only at times of crises, such, such as the current, current pandemic, or even, even during peace must fall, that, that we start reflecting on what we are good for. However, being good for cannot be driven only by moments of upheaval. It must be woven into the very fabric of the university, and it should require us to be committed and have strategic intent, not only in an academic context, but also in a much broader societal one. Uh, so, so I look forward to hearing these discussions and, and the conversations that, that we cannot afford to ignore. There, there are two overlapping parts of this session. Uh, firstly, firstly, we will have three speakers, and that will be chaired by Professor Langa Marlow. And, and secondly, we will have a panel, panel discussion chaired by Professor Tanwam Tembu. I now, I now hand over to Prof. Marlow to introduce the, the first three speakers for the first session. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Pretorius, for sharpening the focus of, of this uh, session. Uh, it is such a pleasure to chair the three eminent speakers that are going to speak more pointedly to the theme of this session, which is the Engaged University and transformation. Colleagues, Colleagues without, without any further ado, I want, I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, we, we couldn't get a better person to uh, initiate this conversation uh, on an engaged university and transformation uh, other than uh, Professor Andrea Kitt, who is himself a, a research chair for critical studies in higher education transformation and also a deputy vice chancellor. Uh, for further uh, detailed um, bio-not, I refer you to our uh, conference website. Uh, Professor Andre, please do take this away for us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Kumalo. Michelle, can you uh, flag the uh, title uh, your slide for me, please? Uh, dear, dear friends and friends, and friends uh, thanks for use of for inviting me and to my colleagues uh, that are sharing the session with me. 
as, as well as to the participants uh, attending. This, this presentation reflects on an inquiry that is part of a bigger research project that works at conceptualizing the university and its praxis at the engagement and transformation interface, along similar lines as presented earlier today by many speakers. These studies within the work of the research chair on critical studies in higher education transformation. Previous slide with a title slide. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, at Nelson Mandela University deploys mixed methods research which, which include traditional literature reviews, mapping and thematic reviews, reviews, critical discourse analyses, and, and research that mobilizes empirical and non-empirical material. The, the different research initiatives within the broader project use both primary and secondary sources in critically analyzing the social justice transformation trajectory of South African universities and that of global higher education generally. Bringing, bringing postgraduate students and academics together, the research is located within critical university studies. Critical university studies, as framed within the global north, is generally rooted in the nostalgic idea of the public good university that existed somewhere in the past and which recently became entangled with exploitative neoliberal forces. Departing from this position, the, the NMU project, project instead aligns with a formulation of, of CUS, Critical, Critical University Studies, that, that you views the university as deeply entrenched in the historical and present social reproduction of inequalities, inequalities more importantly, and, and the furthering of a modern, of a modern colonial global higher education. Imagining, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm mobilizing the work of Stain and Andreotti, because this was also discussed earlier today and actually first raised by Prof. Pakeng in the early session. Critical, Critical University Studies, thus understood by Nelson Mandela University and our research program, views the public good university as a future aspiration and not as an historical phenomenon. Our reading of CUS is also close to abolitionist university studies and work on the university and the undercommons. Part of this research is supported by an NRF grant. For this particular study, Patrick Ajibade and I deployed bibliometric analyses with a systematic review to explore the link between engagement and transformation in research reporting on higher education. Why? Two key review reports by the Council on Higher Education, one and two decades into democracy, respectively 2004-2016, as publication dates, reflect on the slow pace of transformation and the sad saga of engagement in the university sector post-1994. Perhaps we thought studying our research strength through bibliometric analysis may throw some light on these patterns and disclose to ourselves and for ourselves the patterns of our work and its historical and ideological production and future projections. This presentation focuses only on thematic, on thematic keyword analyses, though the study covers authorship, authors of networks, institution networks, institutional clusters, and the citational analyses as well. Multiple tracks of bibliometric data were generated. I am reporting on two. First, for the purposes of a global thematic analysis of research reporting on higher education transformation in publications, we focused on the Web of Science core collection of four databases with a sample parameter of 2,562 articles published over the past five years. Second, we focus on the subnet collections which slant towards South African higher education, searching for articles and reports that combine transformation, change, and decolonization on the one end, and engagement, community engagement, and responsiveness on the other, and plot these over four five-year periods between 2001 and 2021. The total sample size is 6,360 research artifacts. From the samples, we deploy various inclusion criteria using citation analyses, 
authors with a certain number of published articles, keywords should appear a minimum of 10 times and so on. Different inclusion and exclusion criteria apply across the analyses in these, in these slides and are unpacked in the raw research report. Next slide, please. This data is extracted <clears throat> from 12 collections under the subnet umbrella, focusing mostly on South Africa. It indicates an expected trend in the quantum of writing on engagement and transformation within the South African higher education research context from 2001 to 2021. Next slide, please. In this slide, we present four clusters in the research writing that evolved over a period of 20 years. The red cluster the inter shows the interface between management and university transformation, which is on the green side, pointing to the dominance of the compliance discourse as far as transformation is concerned. The light and dark green side, uh, which uh, points to the conceptual and programmatic distance between transformation and engagement, transformation towards the lower left-hand side of the slide and engagement towards the upper and middle uh, top and slide, or top and part of the image as well. And then the blue cluster and light green cluster shows the entanglement of health and well-being with engagement, management, and the performance discourse in higher education research studies. And the fourth uh, trend is writing on engagement between the light green and also the type of avocado green. Writing on engagement includes student engagement, community engagement, workplace engagement, stakeholder engagement, employee engagement, and so forth. Slide four, next slide, please. Visualizes the thematic keyword analyses between 2016 and 2020, focusing on the research on the South African university sector and confirm on the right side of the image, the research corridor of well of well-being, health, care, engagement, and performance. Gender, sexuality, violence, HIV, AIDS, and disability form a cluster at the bottom of the image with transformation and decolonization connecting the bottom and left sides of the image in yellowish, uh, purplish colors. Engagement and performance shape the top part of the visual image and connect innovation and achievement into the big category of research on higher education transformation. The disconnect between engagement and transformation is confirmed with management and policy patterning the watermark at the center of the image. The late arrival of work on decolonizing the university is also observable in the left bottom part of the slide. Slide five, please, or the next slide. This slide presents a thematic keyword analysis for research relating to our sector for the past 20 years. The transformation and engagement cleavage, as you can see, is prominent from the middle outwards to the left side of the slide, and decolonization as a field of interest does not show up if observed over a period of two decades. Gender is coming through stronger than race as a category of research interest. Next slide, please. This slide shows the global higher education transformation trends over the past five years, including work on diversity, equity, and so on. Note the emerging distance and schism between what Salim Badat calls the online turn in higher education on the left in green and transformation in blue and purple on the right. That particular schism is telling. Four themes are discernible. The online turn, technology, ICT, and COVID-19, leadership, equity, pedagogy, and social justice in the reddish color, management, governance, policy, and innovation in the light green colors, and of course, transformation, curriculum, decolonization, gender, race, and language in the purple bluey side on the left of the image. There is a notable connection taking shape between transformation on the one hand and curriculum and knowledge on the other in this and the previous slide. Yet engagement does not emerge as a key theme in studies on higher education transformation. And there is a palpable weakness in African connections. Our work seems to be disembodied from our continent. So what, you may ask, what does this analysis tells us? Where does it point us to? 
Let me make two points on the so what question, and I'm almost done, Chair. One, these types of studies add to and are crucial in sketching a critical ontology of ourselves, a better and more accurate way of disclosing ourselves to ourselves, the objectification of ourselves within our own work. This is a key theme for critical university studies that is developing a critical ontology of ourselves of ourselves that has to be considered not certainly as a theory, a doctrine, nor even a permanent body of knowledge that is accumulating. It has to be conceived as an attitude, an ethos, a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are is at one and the same time the historical analysis of the limits that are imposed on us and an experiment on their possible transcendence and here I have been quoting Maya 2019. Another way of putting this is through Ngugi's injunction that decolonization should start with seeing ourselves clearly. Two, and this is the final substantive point, Chair. Our research themes through this analysis suggest a conceptualization of engagement and transformation and their non existent interplay as putting the change project of the university on the back foot from the very beginning. The trends in the research themes may also say something about our emotional and effective investment in the system. And perhaps there is a correlation between these trends and the transformation and engagement inertia in South African universities. Kiet and Mutwa and uh, Prof. Mutwa earlier referred to this paper, argued that because the hegemonic higher education field imaginary delineates our interpretive and analytical schemes, the meanings of the notions of engagement and transformation are usually expressed within a generative matrix that confers legitimacy on our common practices and pursuits that embeds them in a normative scheme, as what is now happening on the SDD, SDG discourse in universities, not only in South Africa, but globally. In the case of engagement and transformation, so they argue, such a matrix has constructed and entrenched conservative new liberal ideas and located them within a normative scheme that is palatable to the system and our individual selves. That is a benevolent charitable empowerment conception of engagement and an excess equity compliance driven understanding of transformation became justified, rationalized and normalized and are thus falsely presented as being progressive from a social justice vantage point. It is perhaps these formulations that disallow a productive transformation engagement interface. It is our task to fix it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh uh, Professor Kidd, um, for such a, a well-timed but sharply appointed, informed and informative uh, discussion on how we can uh, sharpen um, our advances towards transforming the academy, uh, having an engaged university that actually moves towards full uh, transformation. I am uh, amazed by the array of data that you, uh, your, 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 your chair is, 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 is focusing on and is working on. And I'm hoping that we can have uh, these conversations beyond uh, this session. Um, I'm really uh, uh, happy that uh, you, you kept uh, within uh, time and I'm not going to uh, put any pressure to the next speaker. Um, and our next speaker is none other than our history-making uh, of the University of South Africa, our first female vice chancellor uh, in the 148 years of uh, this uh, revered institution of our country, uh, Professor Puleng Lengambula, who is a trained feminist ethnicist with a PhD in social Ethic. Um, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I appreciate the introduction, but more so the expansive uh, research that uh, Professor Kit 
has shared with us around uh, how entwined uh, teaching and learning research and engaged scholarship uh, are to the idea of an engaged university and the thematic areas that university have to pay attention to. I also want to uh, enjoy in the work uh, we are at hand on, that of reflecting on the relationship between transformation and engaged scholarship. I want to start by stating or reaffirming the fact that we are at the gross crossroads in the higher education sector, that universities face unprecedented pressures on multiple fronts. And these uh, pressures are not just limited to issues of financing and funding of higher education, the, the, the dynamics of contextuality and globally resonant uh, education, uh, which is attentive in its curricular pedagogies and epistemologies to the local, but also international context. My suggestion in this presentation is that uh, for us to question the notion of uh, engaged uh, scholarship or engaged university, we must first start asking the question, what is the value or validity of higher education system? Is it um, enabling for students, staff, or those who are in the pursuit of knowledge, as we are often told, uh, in transformative impulse for self, for family, for community, for society, but also the global ad agenda? What are the criteria that are necessary for evaluating this impact as well as uh, the engagement? And how might we see in these criteria that are understood as integral to transformation and engaged scholarship evident um, in the sustainability, the sustainable autonomy of the knowledge uh, systems themselves, but also the manner in which institutions of higher learning are organized. How do we deal with issues of uh, gender, but also inclusion, inclusion of students living with disabilities, as well as those who are LGBTQIA? Are they embraced? Do they see themselves in the curricula that they're learning from? Or do they see themselves as aliens in the knowledge arena? The other framework that I want to use in this discussion around um, engaged university is the context within which uh, the articulation of higher education takes place. The context of digitalization, the context of South Africa and it's your special political location and economic location as a consumer of digital systems and not necessarily an owner, therefore its implications as an engaged university. Is engaged an engaged university one in the forefront of constructing knowledge or co-constructing and inventing knowledge, which is shared, developed, optimized in the multiplicities of sectors within society? Or is it, a, is it one which is a, embroiled or entwined with the digitalization systems that it has to uh, uh, buy, uh, which it has no control of in the teaching uh, and learning processes, and therefore how do we transform such. The last part that I think is integral to discourse on transformation and engaged university is the overwhelming commodifying and disrupt disruptive thrust of the digitalization system, which, uh, which we've had to enforce, particularly in the context of COVID-19, where digital systems and platforms, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, which we are told is at the heart of the 4.0 industrialization, but also the multiplicities of other educational uh, digital resources uh, tend to be owned or located within the global north. The recent experience of uh, WhatsApp is a, a testament in point of the implications, but also contradictions of the context of learning within which we are 
uh, engaged in. For me, it has become crystal clear that uh, as members of the university epistemic communities, we must be en engaged more than ever. But it is also clear that the old order has to give to new paradigms. This is particularly true because whilst uh, the old paradigms may have been so uh, just uh, and committed to the public good, the new transformations seem to be at the center of the commodification of knowledge, including the dependency on the institutional and ICT infrastructures that are not necessarily available for the global South. Mahmoud Mamdani's uh, book around the commoditization of a uh, higher education system uh, and its uh, implications uh, when entwined with the global financial systems that never saw it an important uh, lever for Africa's uh, knowledge systems to be at the center uh, of the knowledge economy is one example that we need to start paying attention to in the post-COVID context for our engaged scholarship to manifest. The second uh, a scholar that I find interesting in our discussion of an engaged scholarship and, and, and the transformation that we ought to engender is Antonio Gramsci. And I, 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 I find it uh, quite interesting that we have to go reread the classics uh, of scholars such as Gramsci when it is not fashionable even to think well as uh, uh, um, the, the, uh, the Paulo Freire, the, 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 the Brazilian scholars, who remind us that um, um, education is, is in itself dead. And if it does not make the principle of justice effective for all and in the plural. But Gramsci goes on to, to stating that the, the, the fact that education uh, moved towards the marketization of knowledge, the danger is that the weaker sections of society will never see the ability or opportunities of education as that which invites their intellectual agency in contributing to the changes in societies within which they live and through knowledge. And I think this is quite critical at this point when majority of us are singing uh, monolithic um, uh, uh, songs, uh, if not uh, cultures of transforming universities where the digitalization systems uh, as transformative impulse looking and addressing their deterministic, their deterministic impulses, which often um, renders us as consumers instead of as co-constructors or collaboration in the, in the knowledge arena as universities. But in particular, I find it very important notion of creative spirit that seeks alternatives in order to ensure that the educational relationship is not reflected strictly to the scholastic relationship but it forms part and exists throughout society as a whole for every individual, but society, in order that um, the, the elites, but also those who aspire to change their realms of life and twine is, is quite important because there is a sense in which university education understood as diachronologically uh, or as counterculture to the idea of democratizing uh, access, the idea of enabling access with success, and the idea of ensuring that university is not limited only to those who are able to afford it. And therefore, it would seem to me that uh, the concept between Amina Bama, Audre Lorde, um, Gramsci, and Paulo Freire on the notion of engaged scholarship is that education at all points must be revolutionary, must be transformative, 
must be enabling of the agency of participants to co-constructing the futures through their participation as moral agents in the learning arena. Finally, I'm of the view that uh, we cannot have discussions around engaged universities and engaged scholarship without understanding the colonial, uh, the colonial throttle over the knowledge systems within the context of Africa, African university or post-school education system. I understand the scholarship of, um, of Gacheni and, 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 and others around asserting decolonial scholarship within the context of South Africa, but also as important impulses as in similar ways that um, uh, uh, um, Ngugi already cited, but also in similar ways that Itumeleng Mosala, uh, Madipuane Masinga, Messi Odioye, and others have asserted that the exigencies of Africa uh, 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 and the contradiction, neo-colonial, but also globalization, which has tended to snuff out the public systems from being um, a strong players, uh, where the market has become the he hegemonic or hegemonic uh, disruptor of the efforts of collectivist and transformative impulses towards the knowledge arena has become quite important uh, reassertion. And I think uh, of Mafeje, who reminds us that um, the idea is never to be uh, subaltern or in the post-colonial uh, discourse, the idea is never to be marginal uh, or to be rendered marginal, but the idea is to claim voice, participation and co-constructing of knowledges, innovation, inventions, civilizations and ideas that promote dignity, that are humanizing, that ensure that knowledge is not limited just to a few and that uh, uh, knowledge systems produced by universities are relevant for the knowledge economy, but also for transforming societies. In essence, it is the gendered uh, uh, inclusive knowledge arena or knowledge systems. It is the ability to ensure that those living with disabilities are given provided the platform to have voice. It is also ensuring that the dialogue between natural sciences and social sciences and their, their pedagogic, if not uh, epistemological resonance uh, makes sense and meaning uh, for society. And therefore I'd like to conclude by saying engaged scholars and engaged universities will not exist if they do not enable and facilitate the pursuit of wisdom as uh, the philosophers tell us, the pursuit for humanizing, dignified, inventive environments that allow people to come as they are, but to contribute to the knowledge systems and knowledge arena in the contextual environments within which they exist, whilst at the same time aspiring for their knowledge systems to find a global footprint. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Prof. Lengabula, uh, uh, I, 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 I am very um, happy that you have drawn the nexus between um, knowledge systems and the contribution to the global knowledge uh, economy, and how an engaged university uh, affirms the process of co-construction. Uh, the sensitivity to knowledge systems that hitherto have not been part and parcel of the academy. And uh, you have drawn uh, very incisive uh, links to what a transformed university must engage with. And uh, what I find very intriguing is how you have problematized the can uh, in a way. Okay, okay. 
Right. Uh, in fact, he was he was he was busy reflecting on your presentation. <laughs> so, oh, Prof Kumalo is back. Prof Kumalo, uh, I was just holding the space for you for a while. Um, are you okay? But anyway, thank you very much for holding the fort uh, for a moment there. Um, yes, I, without any further ado, uh, colleagues, I am going to uh, call upon our third and final speaker in this session. And it is um, none other than uh, Dr. Leslie Van Roy, uh, who is uh, at Stellenbosch University. Um, uh, Leslie, the floor is yours. Uh, and I make uh, reference to his uh, abridged biography that is again sitting uh, on our website. And uh, Leslie is from uh, the background on church history and church polity. Uh, Leslie, please do take this away for us. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, every time someone reads my background in church history and church polity, it feels strange. Uh, and that is, of course, given my current role at Stellenbosch as Senior Director responsible for social impact and transformation. It's fantastic uh, to share this discussion uh, with Prof. Lenka Bulan and Professor Kiet. Uh, I thought that I would add a different spin on this conversation uh, to show towards the connection between engagement uh, and transformation uh, by sharing uh, some examples, at least on this side, uh, on, on how we try to change the visual landscape uh, at the university for a number of reasons. And that is because when it comes to symbols and name changes on our campuses, it is most, almost always a very public debate um, on the one side. Secondly, of course, name changes and, and changes linked to towns and of course also public symbols ask for deep engagement uh, in the story uh, of transforming our societies, uh, often very politicized, uh, and then thirdly, because I think the opportunity for reimagining or visually representing our universities also allows for a very specific and particular engagement that allows uh, members of our broader publics uh, to engage on, on the stories of, his, uh, of our universities, the histories, and of course, also how we would like to represent and present our universities visually. A brief overview, uh, Chair, most of the discussions about what we term at Stellenbosch's visual redress really is embedded or was formalized around uh, uh, the, the Roads Must Fall movement. Uh, I'll share a specific an action or activation at Stellenbosch and then mostly share some examples of that and point to the way forward. Now, of course, changes visually on all our campuses, in particular, the, particularly the historically white universities, started in the 80s and, and 90s uh, and, and continues up to today. The debates around statues, busts, names uh, remain prominent uh, and almost all universities uh, since the late 90s and particularly after Fees Must Fall had to rethink uh, whose photos, whose portraits, whose paintings are up on our walls uh, linked to, of course, also what is public at our universities. Now at this university, given its very particular history, uh, of course, it, it asked for a very quick and early change in names. Um, a year on, on, at the Stellenbosch campus in the late 80s and 90s, name changes linked uh, to that of the former prime ministers and other, uh, at that stage, eminent uh, ministers uh, was changed. But the process happened quite quickly and really uh, did not happen did not happen at all in a very in a engaged manner. So the name was up one day uh, and uh, upon approval without deep consultation and deep engagement was changed uh, in, in, the, in the early nineties in particular at this university. Uh, and indeed uh, it was really only after the Fees Must Fall movement uh, where conversations around changes became quite deep. Perhaps something on, on how we define a visual readers at Stellenbosch uh, it is to make right, to set right, to remove, to change, to contextualize hurtful symbols, uh, symbols in general, uh, and uh, to focus on an African centrality uh, that allows uh, for the sharing of a variety of stories, identities, and histories. It is about finding a common story or a new story, and of course also uh, about uh, redressing or allowing a different sense of public, a different sense of engagement on campus. Um, uh, we've just accepted a visual redress policy through council, in fact, a little bit more than a week ago, 10 days ago now, 
It was a policy uh, that we drafted in 2018-19, in and it brings together at this university all processes linked to visual changes and the naming and renaming of buildings. And this policy flows from what we currently have as the university's transformation plan with its focus on three pillars, that of programs, uh, people and places, and particularly gives expression uh, to the notion of place and, and therefore also institutional culture. Uh, you know the story of, of uh, the Rhodes Must Fall movement and how it started. So I, I will not say much about this, perhaps uh, to say that almost at all institutions where uh, we have formally started processes of visually changing and, and, and re-representing uh, our, our symbols and, and building names really formally started here or at least in a formalized way started post uh, the Rhodes Must Fall movement uh, and of course found particular expression in uh, uh, very open sometimes harsh and, and violent conversations around symbols and art uh, on campuses. And it is very interesting to see how many publications have appeared since 2015 onwards on this notion uh, of, of uh, uh, visual identity or visual redress. Uh, and that name really takes on a variety of forms. Um, uh, the work of Shaman in particular, I think, highlights um, the visual identities and cultures and how that has changed at our institutions over the last decade or so, almost a decade. At Stellenbosch, uh, almost a, a month after the fall of Rhodes at the University of Cape Town, um, we removed what was really something that should have been removed in the 90s. Um, and that was a plaque in a corner of one of our buildings uh, that honored uh, uh, Hendrik Verwurt and that was really linked uh, to the former name of the building. Now, the building name was changed and almost everything in the building was redone. But in a corner of, of a building, um, uh, a plaque was found. And this uh, really enacted what became uh, a very open and frank conversation about the visual identity of the building, ironically, more or less a month after a Rhodes fell. And it indeed allowed what was then known as the Open Stellenbosch Movement uh, uh, to push the university even further in acknowledging and breaking away uh, with its apartheid history. Uh, it received a lot of attention on and off campus uh, and really also allowed for a deep conversation between the broader community of Stellenbosch and that of campus and really at, at this institution allowed uh, from 2016 onwards a formalized way on, engage, on engaging and thinking around our symbols uh, and names almost um, well, for the first time, also leading to a formal process, an active formal embedded process that in, in, in a real way allowed uh, for the development of what now is a policy on this matter. Some of the depictions uh, on the day, you see the plaque uh, to the left, uh, a, a, a protest uh, that was part of the day uh, to the right. Uh, with the son, uh, the grandson uh, of, of Hendrik Verwoerd, Wilhelm Verwoerd, uh, next to the, the current VC, Professor Wim de Villiers, uh, and a, a ceremony around the removal of the plaque uh, that took place. Perhaps something about the policy now, I think it, it does allow for the university to engage better with its publics. And then uh, I'll end off with some examples. I indicated that it is embedded in the transformation plan of the university and really allows for a rethinking and a renewing about institutional culture, most definitely a more welcoming culture. And given the fact that it asks for deep symbolic changes on a university campus without any borders, uh, there is no gate, no entrance, uh, no fencing uh, between the, the town and the university community. In fact, buildings and houses are mixed. Uh, it does allow for a very open, sometimes very harsh conversation between uh, the university and its, in, and its locals or its, its publics. Um, that indeed allows for a conversation that is much uh, richer, I think, and deeper. Um, also, sometimes a very open and frank confrontational uh, manner. Um, it allows uh, for the contextualization of names and symbols, which also allows uh, for a almost a route on campus uh, from and, and, and between contextualization boards where students, staff, and members of the broader public can read up uh, on names, name changes, new symbols. Uh, and of course, we would like it to impact even more on teaching and learning and research as, as part of an integrated understanding 
uh, of an engagement. We distinguish between institutional processes and those are processes that are led centrally and then uh, uh, change processes visually and in terms of names uh, through faculties and here the faculty committees for transformation play a key role. Some examples uh, of new symbols on campus uh, perhaps the most prominent one is the circles, circle on the central square um, uh, that depicts a number of women, uh, 11, uh, that, uh, that was selected uh, through a survey among students, the women students in particular, who identified some of their role models and some of uh, uh, the individuals that they think we should associate with more. And it really was the first time uh, that uh, uh, since uh, the what is now the central square of university was developed that we added a new artwork or an, uh, sent quite a central art piece uh, to the section and it's fantastic to see how both students staff and members of the public engage around this then um, uh, a number of contextualization boards are up that shares the stories of what is on campus or what was on campus and i'll share why uh, we also depict something of history here you see examples of, of building names uh, these are uh, two contextualization boards in front of the faculty of theology perhaps just for intersect we have three uh, relatively large statues on on campus and, and here you see depicted one space. These are, are building names that tells the story of the individual um, uh, that um, uh, whose name is connected to the space and the building. Uh, and here are examples of boards that shares the story, both of the building and of the community that is housed in the building. In this case, the law faculty and the law clinic. Uh, and here the contextual relation boards of the what is now the Adam Small Theatre complex on campus. Now, here is an interesting example of old and new together. We decided to contextualize both the new name of the theatre complex, now the, the Adam Small uh, Theatre complex, formerly known as the H.P. Tom Theatre uh, complex, uh, and as a way to um, give an indication of um, one, who we are and who we would not again want to be we decided to contextualize and share the story uh, of, of the previous name of this facility uh, also uh, to remind ourselves of something of the complex uh, and, and partially sad history of the institution and and uh, for those walking past and engaging or sitting or using the facility uh, both these boards are available to read something of the history it is also a way uh, to indicate that it is not an erosion of history uh, indeed uh, it also shares something of the uh, I suppose, irony connected to the individual of H.P. Tom uh, and, and the celebrated figure uh, of Adam Small, almost as a juxtaposition of, of two stories. A new symbol in front of the old main uh, building, and this is the preamble of the constitution, uh, highlighted uh, with a contextualization board to the right, and all contextualization boards are in the three uh, languages used on campus. Another uh, version of, of contextualization of visu visually representing something of our history and story is found on the glass panels of what is the uh, arts and social sciences faculty's main building. This depicts uh, the history of forced removals in the area, also the area around or uh, the area on which the building was built many years later. And it helps students and staff to understand that the history of forced removals and that of this building and this space of campus is intertwined and connected. And indeed allows, except for the exterior focus on space, it allows uh, for a full depiction of forced removals and the history of the Flakta community inside the building. Uh, the building is open to the public and in that sense is, uh, also allows for an engagement on the stories uh, with individuals uh, who lived in the area. Welcoming benches that depict a number of languages on campus, um, official languages and other languages uh, used in this region. Uh, and and uh, very importantly, as was asked during engagements with the Open Stellenbosch community of 2015, 16 and 17, uh, we've also brought, uh, we've also added 17 maps of all uh, the living areas in and around Stellenbosch as a way to connect uh, the uh, blankness of campus with that of communities. And, and very often, as uh, if you see the maps more closely, you will see that the communities represented here are split and divided in a typical historic apartheid style with a road or a, a railroad. Um, and, and we've tried to symbolize uh, the, the connectedness of the communities with campus by laying 
in maps next to each other as a way to indicate something of the bridge building exercise. We've recently done a bit of a survey among staff just to see how over the last three years they've experienced at, at the work. I'll just say, share three slides, I think. Uh, and we will do a similar survey among students and external stakeholders, and we'd like to do it separately just to see if there is a different feel or a different uptake uh, on these matters. This is just, uh, to, uh, and, and these were specifically done, um, uh, completed by members of the faculty committees for transformation at this institution, mostly the members of the faculty committees, uh, just to get an indication of how, if indeed, colleagues have noticed artworks and contextualizations on campus, uh, what they have noticed and which works stand out. Uh, very interesting what they have seen and, and what they have not seen. Uh, of course, the overall reaction of uh, the initiatives where, where one is uh, very little and five is extremely high, uh, just uh, to get a sense of what colleagues sense. And indeed, if it, um, there were a number of questions, I've highlighted these. If, if indeed uh, colleagues are of the opinion that it helps to create a more welcoming space. And lastly, if it uh, contributes to uh, a learning environment on campus. The last example I'll share uh, is that of the latest name change uh, at this university, and that is of Kutua, where we, will, where we indeed followed a very open public engagement process after the decision was taken to remove the name of R.W. Wilcox uh, from this particular building. Uh, uh, we consulted quite widely with a variety of stakeholders uh, on campus and off campus uh, to propose a new name. 17 proposals were received also from members of the local communities. We decided uh, to make sure that we directly involved the communities or publics represented in the university's institutional forum, uh, where 25% um, uh, of the, the seats in the forum uh, six seats uh, are, uh, are taken up by a, a variety of either NGOs, public structures, education, health, um, and civil society organizations, organizations in general. Uh, and we use these structures through the institutional forum uh, uh, to with students and staff make proposals and in the end 17 uh, was received. Uh, the process was evaluated by the naming committee uh, and, of course, linked uh, to what was then uh, the draft visual redress policy, now a food policy. Um, a, a name was selected uh, from the 17 and in the end uh, was that of Kurtua. And, of course, just before it was announced, we entered into final conversations uh, with the broader Ku community around uh, the use of the name, sensitivities linked to the name, how we should address uh, the name change and, of course, allow uh, uh, representatives of the, the KU structures, uh, uh, the Kohokwa uh, structure in particular, closest to the Stellenbosch community, to be directly involved uh, in the decision and in the process in the end. The name has, in the meantime, been changed. And now we would like to contextualize the, the person and personhood of, of Kutua further. And this really is makes for very interesting conversations up to now. I've, I've shared a photo. Uh, a relatively public photo of who we believe Kurtua to be, but of course no photo of the individual exists. In fact, it is quite clear from historians that this depiction, the general use depiction, uh, um, uh, really uh, depicts a woman of a perhaps a different cultural background and a totally different era altogether. Uh, and we've been challenged both by the Ku community and by historians to by design reimagine the complete story of the individual in a fuller way, and perhaps also reimagine visually uh, the story uh, of the uh, Kohokwa community, uh, or the Kohokwa uh, uh, chiefdom, the Khoranaikwa uh, chiefdom, and of course, uh, the, the, the notion of history uh, around Kutua. This will also be a very public process. Uh, we will invite individuals and structures, um, uh, civil society organizations, historians into the conversation, and in the end will depict visually in the foyer and hopefully also in the glass look of the building, something of, of the story. The publicness of this process allows the process to be deep and embedded. Of course, it slows down the process and sometimes very deliberately shows uh, slows down the process uh, as to allow deeper engagement, but in the end it does allow for a very fruitful deep uh, and impactful engagement with uh, the university and its publics 
and also allows uh, for further engagements on curriculum, et cetera. Chair, I'll, I think I'll stop here. I think I'm out of time just to say that we've just uh, uh, released a publication that highlights something of the work done up to now and year chapters has been shared uh, or written by colleagues, students and members of our, our local communities as to share something of the processes and lessons learned up to now uh, at this university. And over the next couple of years, uh, we look forward to deepen that engagement and to allow for a fuller conversation uh, around a way uh, to enact transformation in an engaged manner uh, to indeed uh, better the university and renew its focus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie, for that very intriguing uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, everybody will appreciate uh, that you did indeed take full advantage of uh, the, the time, the extra time that we profited from the uh, two illustrious uh, speakers that came before you. Uh, and yes, um, we only have a minute to move over to the next session, but I want to take this uh, half a minute to thank all the uh, three speakers and our session, um, um, the, the Professor uh, Pretorius who introduced the session uh, to us and of course overlapping to the next panel discussion. Thank you very much colleagues and uh, Professor Mtembo, the floor is yours to take away. Is, um, is, am I now on uh, Professor Mtembo not available? Yes, okay, Prof. Right. Thank yes. you. Yes, Paul? I was saying yes, Prof. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Right. Can I then uh, ask uh, that we move uh, very quickly? into the uh, respondent uh, space uh, with our colleagues. And we'll ask, uh, Lerato, are you ready with uh, responding uh, to the presentations? And of course, the speakers can take their notes. And after the, the, the respondents, we'll ask uh, for some of the speakers to, to make a comeback. Uh, Dr. Leslie van Rooy, thank you so much for, for that presentation. It's highly appreciated. Okay. Thanks, Larato. Um, thank you very much, Professor Keat. Um, let me first um, acknowledge the speakers and thank you for the presentations. Um, once again, Professor Keat, um, Professor De Gambula, and Dr. Van Rooy for, for the presentations. My name is Larato Mulokom Pachele. Uh, um, just to make mention of that as we just come out of Heritage Month. Um, but to then get into the discussion and, and responding to the presentation, um, in my opening remarks, I would just like to say, you know, that, um, universities are societies within a society. And um, as, as we as students come into the university space, um, we we do not then get to be in a space of forming part of being ambassadors of the university, um, but we, we become stakeholders who come to um, get knowledge um, and then get out of the universities and be alumni, then ultimately becoming ambassadors. So the ambassadorship for me starts primarily when the first year students comes into the university. Um, and I think that's a very critical theme that will drive how um, we engage as students and form part of the engagements in the transformation of, um, you know, of the, of, of the university. And I like um, Dr. Van Rooyen's presentation where the transformation plan of Stellenbosch University uh, prioritizes um, engagements with um, campus engagements and community engagements, because part of the three pillars of a university is not just only teaching and learning and research and innovation, but it's also um, community engagement. Uh, and as such, um, we need to then establish, establish engagement and engagement platforms immediately once students get into um, the university. And that is how I believe that we will then play a successive role in building an, um, a continuous model of transformation within our university spaces. Um, I, I would then like to 
just touch base on Professor Keith's um, presentation in which um, some of the key factors that come out of the research that you are doing, um, these are in terms of decolonization and, and the transformation of universities, these are discussions that uh, young people and us as young people have amongst each other. And uh, we, only, we, we don't primarily get the platforms and the forums um, to, to actually write and contribute um, you know, towards a university's transformation and so forth. But amongst us as students, we do have those engagements, but those engagements, um, you know, happen amongst ourselves as, as young people. Um, and, and, I, and I see that within how you've gathered the, the information for, for, for the matrix that you've just delivered in your presentation, um, there's a very small, small dot um, of decolonization, the terms of decolonization um, and pedagogy, which are only currently starting to, to come up in our discussions as 4AR has impacted um, how you know, um, teaching and learning is delivered to us as students. Um, and I think part of that, that is a very important um, research that I think we will even take as students. But also as a university, we need to then be saying to universities, grant us platforms. Um, and that's where I believe student representative councils and student affairs bodies continue to have an important role um, in creating platforms for students to come and engage the university um, and also shaping um, its transformation discourse. Um, and for me, I particularly think that um, student affairs um, could play a much, much better close proximity role with um, school deans where part of our academic activities and uh, um, deliveries should be engaging with the communities and an extended com um, you know, communities in terms of um, you know, academic projects um, and so forth, um, student entrepreneurship in terms of social entrepreneurships and so forth. Um, so in that space, I would like to just end it for there, from there. Um, and thank you very much for the presentations and hope to engage further. Hey, thank you so much, Lerat, and you're staying within the six uh, minutes. That's also fantastic. Um, thank you so much. And of course, uh, Prof. Pretorius, if you would also like to later on respond to some of these, um, please feel free. Um, my friend George, uh, this is now your turn. It's so lovely to see you here, Mr. Mbalo. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Andre and uh, afternoon colleagues. And uh, thanks actually to uh, the presenters, you know, for really stimulating, you know, uh, presentations this afternoon. And I can see that this is not meant to be a graveyard session at all, Chair. Um, you know, uh, I will start, you know, in terms of my remarks with, uh, you know, uh, what uh, Prof. Andre Kiert you know, uh, has tried actually to unpack for us. And I find, I must say, quite a fascinating take on what has been uh, published already, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector on uh, the nexus between transformation as well as uh, engagement. You know, I, I, that to me was actually a very useful one. Maybe begin now to begin to see how, what are the themes? What are the thematic areas? And one can hope that uh, the, his research, you know, center, you know, is o o going to actually to be able to advance, you know, the, the, the discussion, you know, what also was being raised, I think, uh, by the previous speaker, you know, about uh, the lack or perhaps, or for a lack of a better word, uh, not much attention yet being actually uh, written about decolonization. So the bibliometric analysis, you know, for, for, for me, you know, uh, really actually is uh, an aspect that needs to be, you know, uh, um, for, from time to time be embedded in how actually we begin to look for uh, thematic gaps in our knowledge system, in the articles that gets published, you know, and also to see whether they are you know, areas whereby there can be better, you know, alignment uh, for universities. 
But uh, one thing that I, I, mean, I was battling to find, you know, uh, in, in those presentations uh, is around really a radical approach to transformation in institutions. Uh, you know, because uh, maintaining the status quo is well and good for it until as a particular point. But uh, if the events of 2015, 2016 are anything to go by, that's where we will begin to see that actually institutions will eventually always be on the back foot, be responsive to some of these actually uh, uh, important uh, fundamental changes that needs to happen in our institutions. The knowledge system itself, the, what the students actually formations were calling for around decolonization. And when we were caught really off guard as, as many of our universities, and we haven't really uh, begun to uh, demonstrate actually how we are grappling with that as Prof. Uh, uh, Pretorius was also actually alluding to in his uh, remarks that we need to grapple with the hard questions of engagement as well as of, of, of transformation. And uh, again, the issue that is raised, you know, in terms of this uh, bibliometric analysis, you know, uh, where they seem to be a disconnect, you know, uh, from uh, uh, now the African connections according actually to the presentation and also the what Andre called the transformation and engagement in Asia. It also, again, you know, if one were to uh, superimpose that even to the knowledge project of our institutions, where if you were to look at the collaboration in, in terms of research between our universities within the continent and also within South Africans actually geographical area, you will then realize that actually there's still a lot to be done. You know, just around 5% of collaboration happens within the continent. You know, that tells us a story, but most of these co collaborations are with the global north, you know, between uh, our institutions and actually those in the north. So that is something that actually that we will have to really begin to put a much more focus on going forward. I liked actually what Prof Lingabula also actually was putting on the table, you know, in terms, especially in terms of the, within the context of the COVID, when it comes to digitalization, but also in terms of the marketization, you know, uh, and, you know, of uh, uh, our knowledge, and it really raises some red flags. How, as universities, as she actually argues, is that we have become more complacent to become consumers, you know, rather than owners of these digital systems, and that is something that we will have to do uh, much, much. Uh, I put more actually focus on, I think, as a sector, you know, in collaboration, of course, with our, our Ministry of Higher Education and Training, uh, the issues around the market hegemonic uh, disruptions to, 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 towards actually the, um, these systems. Uh, I'll briefly then go to what uh, Dr. Van Roy actually was raising as well. You know, because to me, I think uh, the, uh, the, George, uh, can I give you one more minute, please? Eh? I'm closing. I, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. wrapping up. Yeah. That's why I'm. You know, thanks. Yeah, you know, you know, because what Dr. Van Roy actually was raising as well, you know, about the visual aspects of it is that really, as I agree, have quite actually uh, a different take. You know, in terms of the the transformational agenda, but also for I will submit that this also demonstrates the influence of the forest movements on our universities, where now at least there has been a much more rapid uh, uh, response to things that actually we should have done, but now we have to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, and sorry for rushing you. Siseko, uh, lovely to also engage with you. We've been online, we've been busy with the project online and we haven't uh, connected, you know, face to face. So at least this is a good second prize, okay? <laughs> right. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to keep my time. I'm going to be aware of time because I would like to, to sort of engage. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, let me preface my comments uh, by two sort of preambling statements. The first is to say, colleagues, uh, I acknowledge that I am a village fool who knows that he knows nothing. So if what I say is incoherent, at least pardon me by at least acknowledging that I have acknowledged that component. Secondly, 
I come to the presentations, all three of them presented this afternoon, as a student of philosophy. So my engagement with the content will be from that premise. The first of which I'm going to sort of engage the presentations from the bottom up, as it were. So starting with uh, Dr. Van Roy's presentation around the, con around the sort of idea of a situated institution that is responsive to its local context. And there are a series of things, of course, here that come up to mind for me, but one of them, of course, is this idea that I have as a result of the scholarship of Popkowitz and Brennan, where they talk about what they call a social epistemology, right? And of course, they're writing as educational theorists. And this gives rise for me, in any case, to what I conceptualize as horizontal accountability. And we've, all, we've already had a bit of some con conversation from earlier this morning into the midday conversations around accountability. And in most instances, what we tend to find in the South African context is that we've got vertical accountability, where we have institutional administrators reporting to the DHET and the DSI, uh, and not necessarily this kind of horizontal accountability where we are responsive to our local institutions. And so I think this is what we get from this case study uh, presentation that we got from Dr. Van Roy's presentation this afternoon, which then of course leads me to this question of the co-creation of knowledge and uh, Professor Lengabula's presentation around this idea that knowledge and the institution ought to function as a space that facilitates justice for all and her presentation reminded me of the work of some of the leading feminist scholars, uh, specifically the work of Drusilla Cornell, where Drusilla Cornell talks about the alignment of the ethical with aesthetics. And this is precisely what we see, for instance, in Dr. Uh, Van Roy's presentation, whereby the aesthetic component in terms of the presentation of the, of the institution itself and how it bleeds into the community aligns itself with contemporary modern democratic principles in South Africa. And in the conversation, as we've had it from this morning to this afternoon, one of the challenges that I kept on finding was that there was a lot of the term of institutional democratization or universities facilitating democracy as being a conflation of sorts in the sense of, again, I'm a student of philosophy and I like conceptual clarity. And what we begin to see from these first two presentations or these last two presentations, Proplin Gabula and uh, Dr. Van Roy's presentation, is precisely an engagement of that, which is to say, how do we align the ethical with aesthetics in order to be able to facilitate this project of democracy, specifically if we think about the historical ambitions of the sector with respect to the kinds of hopes that the leaders of the sector had at the beginning or at the dawn of democracy in our country, which of course then brings me uh, to Prof Kiert's presentation this afternoon, which draws together a multiplicity of these things. And one of which of course is this component of a critical ontology with the work that is currently being done under his chair at Nelson Mandela University, as well as the research that they've been able to conduct so far. And this critical ontology I find fascinating because it allows us, as he indicates, to be able to really facilitate this deeply embedded responsiveness of the institution, which I think is what a number of South African universities are attempting to do. To a certain degree, I then have a follow-up question from that, which is to say, in us deepening this kind of, these kind of communal ties as institutions and knowledge production centers, how do we do that in ways that don't necessarily pander to the global marketization of knowledge development in such a way that it becomes responsive to some of the key areas that I identified in Prof Kiet's uh, analysis and research. And this inspires a question that I would like to leave all of us with this afternoon uh, as a panel and as, as, a, as the contributors to the conversation for us, I think, to ponder, which is as we begin to develop aspects such as a critical ontology, I wonder whether or not in the process of decolonization, as we attempt to be responsive to our local institutional locales, whether the use of African epistemology and indeed these critical ontologies facilitate our ability to respond to Western philosophical problems using African epistemology, or whether indeed African epistemology poses different and new philosophical problems. And I ask this question precisely because of the role I prescribe to philosophy within the university, a space, of course, or a disciplinary domain that allows us to appreciate what Prof. Lengabula terms the love of wisdom, as it were. And so the question I have, and the question I want to leave us with, thinking of time here, is this question around whether indeed the process of African epistemology allows us to answer Western philosophical problems 
or whether it gives us new philosophical problems that are African oriented. And if that is the case, if we are using African epistemology in service of Western problems, should we or are we to be sort of sort of um, I suppose disinterested in that particular orientation, or should we indeed commit our own epistemologies to answering historical questions? Prof Kiet, over to you and thank you very much. Uh, well, well articulated, uh, uh, Sisego, and well on time. Eh? Thank you so much. I could see that you have a sense of time in yourself. That's brilliant. Um, Kaz, six minutes as well. I'm so sorry to pressurize uh, you know, the respondents. No, that's fine. That's fine, Andre. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Uh, and thank you very much to the speakers. I, I'm not going to refer to any particular contributor. I'm just going to make some overall points that are informed, I guess, by uh, a lot of time. Uh, I spent three terms on the Wits Council, uh, informed by my role in business uh, and just in, in, in the work. Uh, I do through other organizations in, in various aspects of development. And, and, and I think we've used the word engaged quite a bit. And I guess what we need to do is ask whether our universities are engaged as we would want them to be engaged, or are they engaged as in a definition that says that they're not reachable. And the uh, engaged tone is on when you try to reach them. And, and I guess what we want to do is ensure that you, it's a former, that universities are engaged in a way that they not only respond to uh, transformational issues, economic issues, social issues in society, uh, but that they also take the lead in, in enabling some of these debates in a way that the engagement uh, takes into account the context we are trying to transform universities, academia, and society in and how we create a balance between the transformation we would probably all strive for and continuing to build a society that is sustainable and, and can participate in, in what, is, I mean, what is coming out of essentially global dynamics. Now, you know, somebody has talked about globalization, they've talked about uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, markets taking over and uh, markets being an, a, a hegemonic disruptor. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. But I think that we also need to appreciate that uh, we are in some way the little dot on the southern side of the globe. And, and while at times we can uh, impact on the rules and set the rules, very often we have to play by the rules. And, and to me, the challenge we have is how do we, within that context, still achieve the society we want to achieve, uh, enable our universities to be transformational in every respect. So it's, it's, it's curriculum, it's the way different sectors of the university engage with each other, it's how transparent we are to each other, so how transparent is the council to the student body and to workers, and how all sectors of that university begin to appreciate and get onto the same page about the challenges of managing and running a university in today's context, because they are a myriad of challenges and any of which, if we don't actually address properly and any of which that we 
fail to actually address properly could impact significantly on the university. So, so I think that context is important. I think we need to define what we mean by transformation and we need to ask ourselves, transformation to what effect? Uh, I think that, that transformation and our definition and identification of transformation has to be such that achievement of that transformation will lead one to a more engaged university, a more equitable university, and will enable that university and its, its, its students and, and every sector of that university to play an appropriate role within the context in which society finds itself in today. Uh, and, and, and I think that, that that's an important issue that we need to deal with. 4IR has been mentioned quite a bit. And again, the debate is not whether 4IR or not. The debate is how do we utilize within the context of our skills challenges how do we still manage for IR and how do we look for, uh, uh, how do we structure the way we use for IR in a way that actually it, it is equitable and, and uh, significant parts of our society can benefit from. Uh, then I'd, I'd like to just say that I think one of the transformational aspects of university, and I don't think they do this effectively enough, is to tackle head on some of the harder issues, issues related to race, issues related to the economy, issues related to different fissures in society, and, and, and tackle those in a way that enables different uh, uh, thinking around the issue then in a way that helps us as a society and as a country to actually address some of these in a positive way. Uh, so I, 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 I think that, you know, looking at transformation and higher education, my, my view would be that one, the university needs to look at the context in which it is working and trying to engage and trying to bring about transformation. I think we need to define and be clear what we mean by transformation. And if we achieve the transformation we want to achieve, what is the impact of that on society and on the university? I think that different sectors of the university need to relate to each other, not just on what is important particular sectors, but need to relate to each other on what are the challenges, the full gamut of challenges to run a university and manage a university. So I see my time is up, so let me stop there. Thanks. Uh, so sorry, Gazban. Uh, okay. Colleagues, I need to ask you a favor to stay for the next uh, eight minutes with us. We need to take a, you know, a group photo afterwards as well, but I would like to kick off with two minutes each, and we will have to try and stay with these two minutes. Leslie, I see there's a number of responses in your direction as well. So you, if you can't get through all of those, you may want to deal with it, some of them bilaterally as well. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll do it the other way around. Leslie, you start with your two minutes. Then I go to um, Sisek, then, no, sorry, then I go to uh, uh, Prof. Lenkabula, then uh, Prof. Tyrone, and then myself, okay. Thanks, Andre. Perhaps I, I should just say in the two minutes, I really, what, what is missing in this conversation is a bit of a national higher education joint conversation. Um, the, the challenges at this university would not be in, in terms of engaging and the complexities and, and sometimes the outcries for and against a name change or the removal of a symbol or even an understanding of the symbol is not unique to any university. And I miss the fact that we that we do not have a joint national, a, a, a use of bound conversation around the matters. And really, when a name is changed at UCT or a statue is removed at whatever university, it affects all of us. 
both positively and in terms of debates, uh, sometimes very harshly. And therefore, I would really argue for a joint conversation. There are also lessons to learn, I think, in terms of when and how you engage. I think the most valuable lesson that we have learned is that you engaged even before a formal process starts uh, so that the sector is aware, for example, around the theater complex, we engaged with all, all the cultural festivals were involved, uh, the departments of, of um, uh, drama at this university and at other universities were involved, uh, the, the variety of departments in the particular faculty, the broader campus community, including students, and of course, given the public interface, all relevant structures in town, deliberate uh, deliberately selected structures, also those that would not normally participate were involved. And then, of course, when it comes to creating art or adding art, the localness of, of sourcing a local artist to, to be directly involved helps the conversation and helps the debate. Full participation allows, I think, Andre, uh, for a deeper conversation and indeed aids the conversation. So also under your uh, in your possibilities and in your focus on that, I would plead for a, a broader national higher education conversation because I think we can help and learn from each other. Thanks. It's a lovely idea, Leslie. You know, we'll certainly take that forward under the use of an, uh, you know, um, umbrella as well. Okay. Thanks. Um, Prof. Lenka I, I, I think, um, sorry, um, I seem to be deeply I, I I like the um, the the points that um, um, Siseko and Lerato made, where in they they are problematizing uh, the student participation in the in the learning uh, cycles, uh, and 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 the question that Benedict asked uh, in the chat box because. Um, Perhaps in the context where knowledge is, um, uh, we, we claim is easily accessible, the, the agency of the students, uh, given that they come not as empty vessels, but as embodied uh, beings with uh, knowledge, but also with ideas around the future, they would like to co-construct. Uh, I think this is, this is quite an important area that will require uh, efforts at understanding or seeking to being engaged universities will be, will be important. The centrality of the students in the, in the, in the articulation of the education pro, pro project. The, the, the second aspect that I really would like uh, is just a, a small response to the, the processes around the changing of uh, aesthetics uh, as political and knowledge transformations by epistemic communities within the universities, but without. One of the best lessons I, I appreciated was at the University of the Free State under the leadership of Professor Francis Peterson. Uh, one minute, one second. <laughs> please, yes, please yes. Brove. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What, what I liked about that, uh, the methodology was that uh, the, 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 pro, the processes of changing of names or even of removal of stain statue was a, a highly engaged uh, process, including intellectually, as well as with the families uh, uh, associated with the statues, the museums, but also the external participant who are just um, uh, parents, guardians, and, and people around society. And I think such a model where the multidisciplinary engagement from internal uh, university community or epistemic communities and the contextual environments, including global environments is an important idea about engagement that we can draw on. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks. And my apologies, Prof. Man. Uh, Tyra? Andre, I, I really thought that uh, I had the easy part of the session. And obviously, uh, I didn't think that I would be asked to, to respond. Curveballs are part of life, Prof. <laughs> and in the absence of uh, not having 
uh, thought this through. Maybe I can comment from the perspective of UWC. I think UWC uh, over uh, many decades, at least uh, the six de decades of its existence, has been consistent in articulating engagement in a context uh, in which it is aware of its distinctive ac academic role and its potential to help build an equitable society. Our notion of ourselves as being an anchor institution is a cross-cutting area in our new institutional operating plan. Um, and, and in this notion of being an anchor institution, we think deeply about what a key role player we are in our region, in our immediate surrounds, without losing our identity as a national uh, and an international role player. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the establishment of our health sciences uh, right in the central, uh, in the center of the Belleville CBD uh, is in large an academic decision, but it's also based on our understanding of being an anchor institution and how through relocating our health sciences to the center of the CBD, we could play a key role in the revitalization of the greater Tigerberg area. Similarly, our relocation of the Center for Humanities Research uh, far out of outside of the boundaries, uh, the geographical boundaries uh, that we were restricted to in the past, uh, relocating the Center for Humanities Research uh, to the Woodstock area, which is a thriving artistic area. Uh, through the relocation of that center, we hope to contribute to the revitalization of arts within the Woodstock area uh, um, and also within the Greater Cape Town area. Ultimately, we believe that it is not so much that our futures are, be, are dependent on being engaged in and, and transformed. Rather, I think it would be foolhardy to believe that we are unlinked islands, uh, unfettered and free of the currents and the riptides around us. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Pretorius. And from my side, quick, quick colleagues, and thanks so much to the participants for and for those lovely comments as well, and of course to the respondents. Uh, Lerato, you're quite right. I think, um, you know, both in the context of our own research, you know, you know, involving students into that project is something that we need to give attention to. George, the African connection, as you can see from the empirical data is well, it's not there. We need to work at those of, as well and mobilizing those big data to take a snapshot of itself, of ourselves. This of course comes to uh, Siseko's uh, uh, injunction as well around the importance of a critical ontology. Uh, I've always been very, very you know, interested in getting to know ourselves to make those particular actions a bit more meaningful. Um, and one of, the, one of the assumptions under which we work now, which has been proven through many, many studies is, is that particular critical ontology that is not taking shape for us to see ourselves clearly is partly uh, one of the constraints for engagement and transformation. And Kes, um, I can clearly see that you, you have thought very carefully about you know, the university at the interface of transformation and, and responsiveness and the different balances that we will have to pursue to do that. So Leslie, I, I may also want to just urge you uh, if there's a way in which you can respond and perhaps share some of that work, uh, you know, in the chat group uh, or via Bernie, just refer people to some of the online archives that you have on the Visual Redress Project. That would be great for the people who seems to have a very, very keen interest uh, in the work that you guys have been doing. So with that, I declare this uh, session close uh, and many, many, many thanks to all of you who have stayed with us uh, during the latter part of today's opening of the conference. It has been great. Thank you so much to the speakers.
Prof. Lenka Bula, uh, Pro, uh, Leslie van Roy, and also, of course, the respondents, Seiko, George, Cass, uh, you know, and Lerato, uh, and also to Prof. Tyrone. Okay, so highly appreciated to the technical team of yourself as well that has been supporting us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Colin.